fear of the Lord? It's an appropriate question, I don't think, that is uh, out of line to ask, what do we fear? Um, fears can be anxieties caused by the presence of a danger. It can also be an extreme reverence or awe of something. Um, today, we're going we're gonna to look at a passage today that our passage is, it immediately is after our Ten Commandments passage that we just finished this last week. Um, and we're going to look at to see how this applies to us today. It's hard not to ask the question, why would God put in his scriptures a passage on fearing him right after he gives the Ten Commandments, which are really barriers, like we talked about last week, for our own protection, for his people's protection. Why? Why is this linked so closely together for his children that he loves? And I'll be honest, I've seen both extremes of views in this area. I've seen, and I'm sure a lot of you have also experienced, the brimstone, the fire and brimstone preachers, right? We're all sinners, we're going to hell, repent. And I also have uh, firsthand experience the liberal love preaching. That there is no more wrath of God. That God is love. And Christ brought forgiveness and peace and joy. Don't talk about the wrath of God or the fear of God or any of that. It's not there anymore. What if both are important for us to understand? What if both are not just important but vital to us to truly understand? And to go from one side of the pendulum swinging or to the other. And that's usually what it seems like in my experience that is as a result. You see an extreme swing to one side because they've experienced an extreme side to the, from the other side. And neither one is helpful. We're going to look at these today. The Lord, the fear of the Lord, is mentioned over 200 times in the Bible. The Lord obviously feels that this is an important subject to understand. And that's the key. How do we understand it? So, our passage, um, like I said, is only a few uh, scripture passages uh, more from what we had uh, left off uh, from last week. And the Ten Commandments is such a big piece, I could have probably even divided that in half also as well. But this is... Um, this is very, very important. So, in verse 18, Now, when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. That sounds kind of contradictory, doesn't it? Don't fear him. He's going to test you so that you're, you fear him, basically. So that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. To test you is the same phrase that we saw after the Song of Moses, after the Red Sea incident. Um, where they have the bitter water and God turns it into sweet water so now they can drink it. And he says, I'm going to basically, I'm going to test them. I'm going to test my people. And it's not, the point is not to um, oppress them or to destroy them. It's to heal them. Ultimately, he says, remember always that I am the God who heals you. Also in Abraham, with Abraham in Genesis 22 with the event with the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, same same uh, word is used. The purpose is so that the fear of God may be before them, may always be in front of their face. And the reason is so that, or purpose is so that they don't sin. We're going to explore that more. Stood far off, that phrase, very, is, to, uh, is showing that they're being very careful in the proximity to God, that um, they sense that there's danger there, and very intelligent sense. For that as well. <clears throat> the 
fact, um, last week we saw in, in verse 9 of, of chapter, not, not last week, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, um, in uh, chapter 19, verse 9, it says that I'm coming to you. God said to Moses, I'm coming to you in a thick darkness, um, in a thick cloud before the people, so that they will hear me speaking to you and will listen to you, will believe you, will listen to what you said. Flashes of lightning are here are also used in Genesis 15, verse 17, where Abraham and God are doing their covenant, and he ends up making, basically, he splits the two animals. God appears in a torch and goes between the two. It's just basically him showing that he's signing off on this. His presence is there. So it's somewhat of also indicating here that uh, it's somewhat of a renewal of the covenant. Thick darkness is a terrifying power of God's presence that is near them is also talked about in that same scripture passage, that a thick darkness came upon Abraham as he was, went to sleep, basically. Um, Moses' response here indicates that this is not an appropriate response, but yet at the same point, in Deuteronomy 5, 28-29, it seems to be a good thing to the Lord, to Yahweh. Now Deuteronomy, remember, that, that is the end of Moses' life. So, before they go into the promised land, he's saying to them, remember, he's retracting kind of where they've been and where they're about to go. So he's telling them, remember these things, this is what's important, and this is what you need to go, how you need to go forward. So in this particular passage, he says, and the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. This is Moses speaking to Israel. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of the people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. And listen to the pain that is in the words of God here. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments. That it would go well, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. That he's sitting, he recognizes the importance of this place. Oh, if they would always be in this place, where they would always fear my word and obey my commandments. And it would go well with them. But he knows it's not going to be that way. They won't always fear him. What do we do with something that we don't have any fear of? Do we listen to it? Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to fear the United States anymore, unfortunately. We don't take it serious. Um, in Romans 13, Paul actually talks about this, but he talks about it basically a warning of, of governing authorities. He's telling the believers of God, he says, if you listen to governing authorities, first of all, he says um, that they are in, installed by God. They are put in, in place by God to bring order, ultimately. There is a good that is meant to be done by having them there. And he says, if you listen to them, you have nothing to fear. The only ones that really have to fear the authority are the ones that are disobedient. Because that's what they're there for, is to discipline, to keep order, to keep things going in the right direction. If we obey, then there is no reason to fear, is what he's ultimately saying. And that really is ultimately what God is saying here as well. We'll continue on that. In the second section, choose life or death. Again, in Deuteronomy, he's recapping here, before he dies, what to remember and how to instruct Israel, God's people. He says, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your, that your God, that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his commandments and his statutes, his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, then I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over to Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Therefore, Choose life that you may, you and your offspring, may live. 
loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life. And the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give him. This is only one of many warnings that, that Moses gives. He keeps coming back to this um, over and over and over again. Um, but he knows, even he knows, it's not going to happen. In Deuteronomy 31, they're instructed to keep coming back to Jerusalem and, and for the priest to read God's word so that it says that the offspring of Israel will learn to fear God and obey him. That it might go well with them. But again, in the prophets, we see that this is not happening. And this is God's attempt to try and bring them back to him. He's saying, please come back to me so that you do not continue on the, the path of destruction that you're on right now. And in Isaiah 65, verse 2, it says, this is God speaking, I spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices not walking in my way that I've instructed them. They're walking in their own way. Patience and frustration of God is seen here. Because this is talking about many hundreds of years of God dealing with this. This is not just a matter of, oh, we had a bad day kind of thing. This is a long time of them walking against his way. In Isaiah 66, too, it says that, but this is the one who I will look for, who I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Like verse 18 in our passage. Proverbs 16, verse 6, which is wisdom literature, it says, By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. That's really interesting because steadfast love is hesed. And that's something that really is only attributed to God. And Christ did fulfill that. Steadfast love and faithfulness is what Christ was to the Lord. And that's what atones for our sins eternally. But it says, by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So you see both God's side and our side as well. The fear of the Lord shows our part of the, the walk. Through the fear of the Lord, one avoids evil. Jeremiah 2, verse 19 says, your evil will chastise you. Your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that the evil and bitter for you, it is bitter and evil for you to forsake the Lord your God. Interesting that he brought sweet water from bitter water. Now their actions are bringing back bitterness. Right? But it says, the fear of the Lord, the fear of me, is not in you, declares the Lord of hosts. Hardening of heart, is, that's an example of Pharaoh. Right? That's what we saw, the whole thing of Pharaoh. He keeps being warned over and over again. God keeps coming back to him, and he's telling him, if you don't do this then, you're going to have a whole bunch of hurt that's going to come on you, basically. And he doesn't listen. Destined for destruction. Nebuchadnezzar was the same way. The king of Babylon. These are two of the most powerful men in the world at that time. And he was the one that brought Judah, basically, into exile. Daniel is a prophet that warns Nebuchadnezzar even the meaning of the dream that he has. And he tells him, you have this coming on you, this destruction basically coming on you if you don't acknowledge Yahweh as God. <coughs> he glorifies himself. And what happens? God takes his mind and turns it into that of an animal. That is a horrible thought. He becomes, he eats like grass, like a cow, basically. And he's, he's, he starts to look even kind of across between that and an eagle. The, the claws or whatever they're coming on him, and he, he's, he's humble. After a matter of years of being in that place, God gives him back his mind. And what does he say? He says, the Lord is right and just in everything that he does. He is above all kingdoms. He's the most powerful man in the world. He is above all kingdoms. And he is powerful and able enough to humble the pride <coughs> of mankind. And he will do it. All things are his. And he glorifies God. The 
Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way, and sometimes so do we. Like a lot of times, so do we. Ecclesiastes 12, verse uh, 13, in the monthly uh, uh, news uh, thing that, that we have voices, uh, I talk about uh, Ecclesiastes. The wisest man in the world, most likely King Solomon, that wrote this, and he, he explored what the whole purpose of life was. And when he came, at the end of his life, he said, I had access to everything. And at the end of my life, what I finally found out was everything is in vain. Everything is worthless. It's all chasing after the wind, trying to grab after something that you can't grab. He says the only thing, really, ultimately, our greatest purpose to do, the most important things in life, is to fear the Lord and to obey his word. That is the whole of man. Sad that we usually have to learn that same bit of wisdom the hard way before we actually find the wisdom in that phrase. Because that can be a painful road. God's love is exposed by the fact that he continues to try to reach out to a rebellious people that are his, even though sometimes that's reflected in harsh pain and agony due to our own stubbornness. That's really what it comes down to. Many of you know my uh, story. Um, I grew up as a Christian. It was in the environment of the liberal love. Everything is love. God doesn't have wrath anymore. After Jesus, it's all about grace. It's all about love. It's all about forgiveness. Don't talk about the wrath. Don't talk about any of that. Nobody likes that stuff anyways. So let's just ignore it. Because of that, I believed that you could live however you wanted to live, and God would forgive you. Is there truth in that? Absolutely. He will forgive every and any sin when we come to him and repent and ask for forgiveness. Repent, though, means walk a different way. It means change. It's dangerous if we abuse the grace of God, defiantly knowing that this is wrong and saying, I'm going to do it anyway. Will he forgive you? Yeah, but you're bringing hurt upon yourself regardless. That's unnecessary. That's not needed. And that's what happened to me. I ended up uh, doing very well business-wise, uh, financially, and I, but I got to a point where he blessed me, thankfully, for, to realize that I was empty, even though I had a whole bunch of nice things. I was empty. So I... Uh, asked, I repented, and I asked him for. Uh, I asked him to take me out of where I was and bring me to where I was meant to be. Um, and I did not expect him to answer that prayer, um, especially as intense as he did. For the next two years, he basically um, he whipped me around like a rag doll. Really, is what it comes down to. And sometimes when I tell people the story, they're like, "God's not like that." <laughs> I disagree. Um, one time I had a really hard time trying to figure out what he was doing, even. Because I felt like he was just beating up on a human. I'm like, what? That's not a fair fight. <laughs> and it didn't make sense. I'm like, that doesn't feel like God. He was destroying the idols that I had put in front of me. The things that I had put up that I feared them more than I feared God. I didn't fear God at all. I knew mean, there were certain things that he commanded me to do. I didn't care. He'd forgive me, ultimately. I'd do it whatever the heck I wanted to do. Yeah, he did destroy those idols, and that helped me to see him clear. But what he also taught me was the importance of the fear of the Lord. No doubt. The passage that he gave me, when he finally, because I, I, I prayed to him and, and I said, God, if, if Please take me out of this place. I repent. I, I apologize for all that I've done. And I, I promise I will walk my life from now on, your will, your way. Just give me some mercy, basically, here. Give me some relief. And within a day or two of that prayer, I can't remember what it was specifically, but within a day or two, um, he did it. And he gave me a very clear sign uh, that it was him behind it. Um, the passage that he gave me was Matthew 10, verses 28 through 31. And it says, Do not 
fear those that kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. Eternally is what that's basically talking about. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. What is that saying? First of all, he just dropped two sparrows dead in front of me, about three feet in front of me, days before that. That's what got my attention. That was the miracle. Within a matter of five minutes, just boom, dead. That's what brought me to that scripture passage. What he's saying is this. Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he had given them authority. He had taught them already. He told them, I give you authority over all evil. You have power through my name. I'm sending you out into this dark world. But they will not like what you have to say. They will come against you. You will have opposition. Fear the Lord more than fearing this world and what it can do to you, the inconveniences that it can do to you. Because God is much more powerful than them. But he also followed it up with this. Remember though also that you are very precious to God. Are you catching both of those? That's important to grab. What he's saying is don't fear this world and all of the things that it can do to you. Fear God more because he is more powerful and much more terrifying, much more able. He's over all of these things. He's eternal. But also recognize that he loves you so much. You are precious in his sight, in his eyes. That is the importance. Why is that so important? In the prophets, what happens was that God's prophets are meant to be loyal to God. When he gives them his word, they were meant to take that word to his people and to be able to illuminate sin, not to bring them down, not to oppress them, but to help heal them, for to illuminate the path back to him so that they wouldn't be in the path of God's destruction. But the problem was that these prophets, they knew that that stuff wasn't going to be popular with Israel. They wouldn't pay him for that information. They would probably be persecuted. Some of them were brutally murdered for it. And they're like, I fear mankind more than I fear God. And what happened? All of God's people ended up in exile. Many of them killed horrible, horrible things. And what you see in the book and the prophets, that's what they're doing. They're calling out to people. These are his loyal ones that are saying, in fact, Micah even says himself, he says, I fear God more than man, unlike the false prophets. The false prophets prophesy and say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. In Jeremiah 21, he's, or 23, he says, they say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord. Israel didn't despise the word of the Lord. Or I should say, not they didn't despise the Lord. They despised his condemning words in his law. They didn't like the things that the prophets were saying. Sound familiar today? Don't like to hear the prophets being preached because it's uncomfortable. They're like, don't prophesy that stuff. We don't want to hear it. And God says, they say continually to those people who despise my word, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows their own heart, they say, no disaster will come upon you. And God says, you are lying and you're killing my people by telling them these things. Micah says, I give them, I, I illuminate their sins so that Israel can be saved so that they can be healed by God. That's the importance. What I learned about this is this, is that um, God will give me things to say, to do, and he's already done it plenty of times. I know that there are things that are not going to be popular with people at all, but if I know he's telling me to do something or say something, I'm going to say it. I'll try and do it in the most loving way as possible, but I'm going to say it and I'm going to do it. Why? Because I am terrified of being outside of his will. I'll never go back to that place again, ever. Is that healthy? I think it is. 
No matter what I want, it doesn't matter. If it's God's will and it goes against what I want, I'm going to do what he said. Because I don't want to be in his wrath. I want to be in his love. Even as his child, that puts me in a place of discipline that's unnecessary. It's for my own good. But it keeps me in his love. Does everybody follow on that? That's important. So, in the last section here, healthy fear of the Lord. In Proverbs uh, 2, verse 1 through 8, this is wisdom literature. What this says is, my son, if you receive my words and you treasure up my commandments within you, listen to all the treasure talk. If you basically, if you, if you really value it, and you store it and keep it within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining, basically submitting your heart Submitting all of yourself to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight, raise your voice to understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. From his word comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. And he's a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, watching over the way of the saints. Do we submit to the word of God? Or do we consider ourselves the authority? I don't like that passage. <laughs> so I'm not going to read it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't like it. Shouldn't be in there in the first place. <laughs> or do we come before him and say, I don't understand this, but I also understand that I'm a human. I'm not God, and you are God, and this is your word, and it is holy. Help me to understand this. Give me wisdom and insight, and help me to know you better. Embrace it. Do we run from it because we don't like it? Do we cut it off? Do we tell the prophets, don't speak God's word? Do we despise his word? That's what we're doing. Or do we embrace it and say, this is for my own good. God's not evil. He's good. He doesn't do these things to oppress us. He doesn't to heal us. They're supposed, the whole prophets are meant to guide us back to him. For him to say, you're going outside of the boundaries. Come back in. You're in danger. But if we say, I don't like it, we put ourselves in danger. So, his word is, it's a shield. It is a power. Life comes from it. It gives sight to the blind, and it illuminates for us the dangers in our path. Christ is the personified wisdom, the ultimate interpreter of the law, and the fulfillment of it. We can only internalize his word by complete submission to him. Then we will be identified as his people, purified by his atonement at the cross, and given the Holy Spirit of God to write his law in our hearts like we talked about last week and be part of the new covenant. So the final verses, final scripture passage basically here is from the New Testament that I want to show you on how the healthy and fear of the Lord is. It says, on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him, Jesus, you haven't figured that out yet, to hear the word of God, to hear the word of God, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret, which means park. And he also stood, uh, he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Setting into one of the boats, which is Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So the personified wisdom, Christ, is now instructing the people in the way of the Lord as a human. The people were seeking him. And listening to it, unlike all those other passages that we had just seen. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, who bear, who his name means who hears and obeys. I never knew that before this week. But put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. He obeys. He listens to the Lord's word, his instruction, even though he doesn't agree with it, even if hesitantly. 
And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came in and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. That's pretty extreme, one side to the other. An incredible abundance provided a whole bunch out of nothing. All night, nothing. Emptiness, darkness, defeat. So many people I've heard, and I've thought this myself, is why sometimes if I'm supposed to be so victorious as a Christian, do I feel defeated? But then Simon Peter saw it, and he fell. It's interesting that Simon's been called Simon, and all of a sudden now he's called Peter, the rock, in this particular part. So when the one who obeys, the rock, saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, showing complete submission, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And he and all those others that were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. So fathers, also James and John, sons of Zebedee also, who were disciples, who were partners with Simon. And they said to Simon, or he said, Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And they had brought their boats. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed. I would say that's an extreme example of submission. Peter saw and he knew what he understood who was there. Convicted by his holiness. How often are we afraid of that? <coughs> Sometimes that's why we run from it, right? That it scares us. We're like, it shows us, it convicts us of our sin. And we don't want to be impacted by that. We don't like that fear. It's not meant to destroy us. It's meant to heal us meant to expose the truth so that we know our need. Yet if we just stayed in the Word a little longer and embraced it, submitted to it, and let it do its work in us, we'd actually be healed by it and brought close to God. Our initial response is to run, but if we just embraced it, we'd be transformed by it, healed by it. Don't be afraid as an expression of the presence of God. Obedience, listening to him, leaning on him. He will now be catchers of men, is referring to a passage in Jeremiah 16, 14 through 18, where it says, Though Israel is going into exile, I will bring you back after you have been humbled and your sins atoned for, and I will send fishers after you to catch them and bring them back to me. Jesus is rounding together his fishers, just like he said here, you will now be fishers. God is showing that he is worthy, his promises are coming true, that I will run out of my people. So, the last three points here for today that I'm just going to go through very quickly is that the fear of the Lord protects us from our own destruction. To not walk outside the boundaries. I had a, a teacher, his name was Dr. Abel, back in at a school that I graduated from, from my MDiv program, and he, he's made an incredible impact on me. Uh, very, very wise man. But he said, I love this, he said that God is overwhelmingly, uncontrollably an outpouring of love, but he is also overwhelmingly always an outpouring of wrath as well at the same time, of anything that is against him. Sin. Can we understand that? It's hard to wrap your mind around that, right? It's like, how can you always be love and always be wrathful against evil and sin? He is. To take only one puts us in danger. We need to embrace both, because both are there, clearly. Old and New Testament. Christ even talks about that. And clearly, in the, in the passage I just talked about in Matthew, in Matthew 10. Fear the Lord. So it protects us against our own sins. Seeing God as oppressive um, is an inaccurate viewpoint of him. That, that shows us, number one, that we are not coming close enough to him, that we are standing too far away, 
or that we are trusting other people to tell us about who God is instead of walking into his word and letting it work in us. That's the point. Come into it and let it transform you. That's what all of us need. He never is. He doesn't, if he wanted to destroy us, he would have done that a long time ago. He knows what we are. He knows that we're sinful. He knows we're made of dust. He knows that we are packed with sin. And he still loves us. But he's telling us, I'm telling you, this is the way back. Come back to walk in my way. When we do that, then, that's where his grace works for us. He forgives when we, when, when we end up saying, I'm sorry, I made, I made a mistake. He knows that. It's where we don't fear him is when we get into his wrath, into a dangerous place. Fear of the Lord. Fear of this world exposes our lack of faith in the Lord. False prophets expose no fear of the Lord. It's more about me. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I want a good life. I like this whole thing of prophesying God's word and stuff. Fearing the Lord shows that whoever does that knows that Yahweh, his very name, he who lives, lives. And we know he's very real. And we know his ways. And we will be held accountable. And he expects us to walk certain ways, to be in his likeness. And if we're not, then we've got to answer to him for that. That is the fear of the Lord. That's important to embrace. If we fear the world more, that's what we serve. That's what's held up highest. That's what we listen to. That's what we follow. And third, ignoring and minimizing the fear of the Lord puts his people in extreme danger. This is why they went into exile. Because even the people that were meant to be light and salt were not. They wanted to be more like the world as opposed to more like God. And he says in Jeremiah 32, 39 through 40, God says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good. He's talking about the new covenant. This isn't Old Testament stuff. He's talking about the new covenant. For their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. Again. It's only in the fear of the Lord that we actually experience His grace. His love. And we have no reason to fear Him. Have no reason. Because what we follow is the most powerful thing in the whole world, in the whole existence, all of creation, all of the cosmos. And He's pulled us close. We have no reason to fear if we put Him up above everything else. So the proposition is we must completely submit our hearts to God in order to understand the fear of the Lord. It's a blessing for his people to protect them from the lure of sin. Isn't it interesting that God actually does things like this to almost mask some of his own will, that this could easily be interpreted as a destructive and a harsh, bad thing, intimidating people? The only way you can understand this is if you embrace him, if you come close to him. If you stand too far away, it's intimidating. It's scary. But it's also misunderstood. So may we all completely submit to him with all of our hearts in order to understand the fear of the Lord, in order to embrace his grace, in order to feel his love, and to live in his love, and to be glory for him in this world. Amen? Amen.